So today's program is called, So You Inherited a Farm, So Now What? And you'll notice I have two microphones on me. It's not because the speakers are that loud, but we have our, one of our media guys from Lincoln here today. He's gonna be recording what we are covering and what is being covered will be put up online at a later date. And we'll try to, you signed in today, if you gave an email or whatever, we'll try to send out a notification to let everyone, if you'd want to send it to someone else or whatever, it's free and open to the public, okay? So I'm Jim Jansen, the other individual is Alan Benalik, if you know either of us. Has anyone ever come to one of our programs before? Yeah. In full? Okay, yeah. great. So today's program, uh, we kind of will be switching on and off throughout the morning and early afternoon here. First part, we'll be taking a brief look at uh, the current state of land values, cash rents in the afternoon. In the morning, we'll also figure out, okay, if you have an asset, how do you value it? Alan will be talking on communication issues, uh, thinking about what do we have, how do we, do, what, what, do we what, what should happen to it. And um, in the afternoon, we'll be talking more on leases, regardless if you're a landlord or a tenant, it does not matter. The way we approach this is for everyone. And uh, if you have questions as we're going along, uh, you can ask them. I will repeat them so everyone can hear, as well as we can have them um, people online when they're watching this can hear them as well. I was told I'm not supposed to walk in front of the screen, so I'm gonna be on this side this morning, okay? There's, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, first thing, I always like coming to Ashland here because People's Company has helped us out and they helped us out again today. We greatly appreciate it. It's fun doing meetings like this, so uh, there is no free lunch. Um, we really appreciate them helping us out. Nick Smith does real estate sales and Eric Greger does farm real estate management. So if you're in need, please visit with them and uh, be sure to thank them for lunch. I don't know what we're having, but I'm sure it's gonna be good. So a brief outline on what we're covering today and you should have these in your handouts. You'll see, as I mentioned, when we first, first got started, we'll talk briefly on what is your land worth? How do you value it? Regardless if you stand to inherit something or if you stand to gift something to someone, at some point in time, someone will have to figure out what that's worth. Alan's gonna be getting into a little bit on how do you own land. The bigger thing is communication, dealing with people. There's a lot of ways in farm succession and transition to get tripped up in the legal or financial jargon. Your number one goal today is what do you have? What do you wanna do with it? And when I say, what do you want to do with it? What's that goal? There are different goals and there's different ways to do things and it's easy to get sidetracked and should I do a will, should I do a trust? What do you have and what do you want to do with it? If you can answer those questions, the people that can do those kind of things can help you out. But you got to have a clear direction in your mind on what you want to do with it, okay? Afternoon, regardless if you choose to sell, keep, even farm, uh, talking about how do you figure out a cash rental rate, basic ideas behind that, what goes in a lease, what is considered, as Alan refers to as fair, who pays for what, and uh, then we kind of pull everything together. Alan will be doing that, a brief kind of um, 101 on farm transition and succession. And if you own land, when I say a farm, I'm referring to land, okay? So here we go. First part today, what is your land worth? Uh, if you stand to give something to someone, if you stand to inherit something, if you even go out and purchase something, you have to know what it's worth. And when I say what it's worth in terms of if you go to a bank and get a loan, if you ever get a loan on a home, more likely than not you'll have to get an appraisal done. But if you don't need that specific of a number, if you just want to gain some insight on the basics on what land is worth, one place you can look at is the Nebraska Farm Real Estate Survey and Report. University of Nebraska annually surveys people that work in the real estate profession or banking or related industries. As part of our survey, we do two different things. Between the second and third week in March, we release what is called the preliminary estimates on land values as well as cash rental rates. And then in late June, I know it was the last day in June this year, but we post what is called the Nebraska Farm Real Estate Survey report. The report has everything the preliminary estimates do on land values and cash rental rates. 
And it also has much greater detail on things like what percent of land in Nebraska is sold to as a, say for example, a contract for deed or a cash sale or a mortgage. Who bought it, who sold it? Out of state interest, in state interest, did an active farmer buy it? Kind of demographic related things. If you want to find a copy of our report, there's a website in your handout that takes you to the Farm Real Estate Report page. You'll notice on the report page, I think there's like a download button. It's a big red rectangular button. Hit that thing and you'll pull open this huge report. Uh, so once again, it's updated second week in March, between that second and third week in March, and then the final report is in late June. If you don't do the computer thing, call your local extension office. Many of the office managers there, you can either stop by and pick one up. They, might, they won't print you the whole 70 page report, but they'll print out a few of the pages on the topic you're interested in, okay? So Saunders County, Cass County, Lancaster County, they all have extension offices. You're more than welcome to stop by. Most of the time, a lot of the office managers have a couple pages ran off already from the commonly asked uh, tables or charts, that kind of thing. Okay, stay in Nebraska. How many counties do we have? I think I heard 93 from everyone. That's a good response, right? 93 counties, 45 million acres of land. There's more irrigated land in this state than anywhere else in the United States. That sets us apart, right? We gotta manage that well, but we have more irrigated cropland than anywhere else in the United States. About half the state is either hayland or grazing land and the remainder of the balance is cropland, around 20 million acres. And roughly about eight and a half or 8.25 million acres of irrigated cropland. So that makes us a very unique state, right? Now, given that, given the demographics of the state, you go further west you go, there are certain areas where there aren't as many people. What we have done and what we will continue to do is we subdivide those 93 counties into eight different regions. Those eight different regions are in your handouts. Uh, remind me, which county are we in today? Cass. Yep, Cass County's right there. Cass County is about in the lowest portion on where you can go in the, what we refer to as the East District, okay? Now, NAS calls these the Agricultural Statistic Districts, but if you ever have heard someone say the word Crop Reporting District, these are the same regions. Okay. So what we do is we take the entire state, we draw out eight different regions, and we publish regional summaries. And when we get to cash rental rates, probably either right before lunch or right after, we'll start talking about county, and then by the end of my material, we'll be talking about farm level rents. How do we set a farm level rent? So today we're gonna start big, and we're gonna work our way down. Okay, so stick with me. First thing. In your handouts, you'll notice there's a series of seven or eight different slides that highlight different types of land. A different type of land is called a land class. With the different types of land classes, an example, center pivot irrigated cropland, dry land cropland without irrigation potential. Uh, land classes have similar production attributes. Okay, so what's the highest and best use? That's referred to as kind of the land class. And if you take an average across all the different types of land, irrigated, dry land, row crop, whatever you might have, if you did an average across all of them, what you come up with is the all land, ag land value for the state of Nebraska. And when we talk about the market value of an asset, the market value is at a point in time. Okay, does everyone notice that date that we have up there? February 1, 2022, compared to February 1st, 2021. Now on the topic of farm succession, transition, estate planning, and some of these things, when you talk about land inheritance, if they have to establish the basis on the property and some of these things, typically the value of the ground the day of or the day after one's passing, okay? So when it comes to appraisal, when it comes to valuing things, even if it took two or three years for all the legal stuff to get worked out, there are ways you can go back and you tell that as part of the appraisal or as part of the asset valuation, you can tell them I need it for this point in time. Now for the purposes of our discussion today, 
What do we notice up here in the East District or the Eastern part of Nebraska? It looks like things are up, right? Double digit up. We haven't seen this strong, strong of rate of growth as we did about 10 years ago in 2012. So there are similarities again between what happened about 10 years ago versus what's happening now. We had economic uncertainty, interest rates were lowered, commodity prices, especially on the crop side, were up. Uh, some of those different things started happening. So year over year, the entire state of Nebraska, you know it's in the bottom left-hand corner, it says 3360, it's up about 16%. If I take that value in the bottom left-hand corner and uh, put it on a chart, we have this next slide here. So let's break down what's on here. If from where you're seated, you'll see on the bottom left-hand corner here, we start in 1978, and all the way furthest to the right, to the direction I'm standing, we see 2022. Now we got two things on there. What do we have? Well, on the prior slide, we had the all ag land, ag land, all, I always get confused on it. Nebraska ag land value. It's an average of all the different types of land. If I recall right, it was 3360. And that's the blue line. We set the highest priced market value of land in the history of the report. We beat the 2012 average, I think by about 100 or $200. Now, I did not adjust this blue line for inflation, which inflation is back in the news again, right? But we, 2012, it got dry, exceptional crop prices, other things happened, then things kind of subsided a little bit, and lo and behold, here we are again, right? What drives the market value of assets? On the application of land, what are the things that influence land? Well, one of those things are what? Crop prices, livestock prices, the value of what was legally permissible on the property. Now, in your Economics 101 lesson for today, the three C's in the Nebraska economy, what are they? You've probably heard me say these before. Corn, cattle, what's the third one? Corn huskers, that's right. <laughs> at least two of those are up this year, is that right? Well, at least on the... I guess I don't watch volleyball as much as I could or should, but the value of what we have, the blue line, connects to that value of, and I do use corn prices, you could use soybeans, wheat, cattle. I do think we're gonna see higher cattle prices with, um, there's a lot of, in the, especially in the western part of this state and western regions of the United States with drought. There's been a lot of cows, a lot of culling occurring, and a lot of livestock going to market. So the value of what we have relates to the value of what we, do. Now, in addition to higher commodity prices, Alan's talk, he'll be getting into talking about crop shares. One of those big expenses that have been going up has been inputs. This year it's been seed, or especially fertilizer, chemicals, and maybe to a lesser extent seed. So that's kind of the challenges we're facing and when we're negotiating cash rents, Alan will give some tips on how do we kind of go through and negotiate those. The other thing in influencing land values, in my view, there's kind of two things that typically, if you're you know, kind of from the outside looking in, that I would want to be aware of. And the second thing is the cost of borrowing money. How much does it cost for me to go and get a loan if I want to buy a car, a home, a track of land, an acreage, whatever? Um, up here on the red line this time, we have the 10-year treasury yield rate. Now, we don't finance land for 2% loans, but that treasury yield rate is indicative of the cost of borrowing. 10-year treasury yield rate, remember those are government bonds. And it goes to show, we started back in the 1980s when we had a lot of issues with inflation. We set some record levels in that, and it was almost just a straight trend line down, right? What happens to the value of things? Has anyone noticed prices of homes, vehicles, land? Everything is up right now, right? Especially cars, it seems like. The value of what we have relates to the value of what it costs to borrow to finance that. I drove down here today and you can always notice there's plenty of houses from the greater Omaha sprawl being built around here. Let's say you just recently got married you married an accountant, so they're gonna make you 
Uh, for the next 30 years, they're going to allow you $1,200 or $1,500 a month to go buy a home. 30 years straight. Only that amount, no more, no less. Can you afford to pay more or less for something if you're paying, say, on a 30 year note, 3.5 versus 6.5% interest? All else equal, if you hold that monthly payment steady, you can afford to buy more if interest rates are lower. That's the same thing that's happened in the real estate market. Uh, I wrote an article about two weeks ago now when I wrote the article 30 year notes on farm real estate were around 6.25%. I wrote a very similar article a year before that. You're talking around four to four and a half percent. So it's up roughly 2% over the last year. And I would anticipate with the issues that we're seeing with inflation, the next, far, the next Federal Reserve meeting, we'll probably see the prime lending rate get jacked up another three quarters of a, per, of a percent until we see inflation get under control. To control inflation, there's really two things you can do. One is dealing with interest rates. The other is dealing with government spending. So that's what, and there, that's a political thing there, but uh, inflation is a concern and people are looking for places to stash money. One of those opportunities is in land, right? So that's kind of some of the interest we've seen in that. Oh, if you own a home, or residential land in Nebraska. Pay attention to this slide. In the state of Nebraska, when we had our last federal election, there was a referendum vote taken. As part of this referendum, we legalized horse racetrack gambling in our state, and we also specified where the tax proceeds from that gambling are going to be going. If you file a state of Nebraska income tax return, not a federal, but a state, you can get a small portion, about 25% of the portion of your real estate taxes that goes towards helping support the local public schools. You can get that back as a credit, okay? So if you own a home or land in Nebraska, be sure to take a look at this. The credit grew from, I think it was around six or 6.8% 6 for the 2020 calendar year to 25.3 in 2021. And the assumption is being made as gambling if it increases in the state and we have tax revenue coming in from that, this credit would grow over time, okay? If you wanna find more stuff on this, the, where I found the best article was on the Nebraska Farm Bureau website. They have a, a pretty good website explaining on the basics of what you need to do exactly when it comes to this. If you don't do your own taxes, just check with your CPA or tax planning or financial service, whoever you work with, make sure you get this taken care of. A few other things, um, as I said before, as I said before, with the different types of land, there are different land classes in our report, and I know I just skipped some in your handout. Another type of land is center pivot irrigated cropland. I think the highest percent rate increase was in Northeast Nebraska. The value of what we have relates to the value of what we're doing. Obviously, there's been a much higher commodity prices in the last year. With that, we're tending to see farm real estate trend up across the state. People that take our survey, we ask them a series of questions related to what do you anticipate? So roll the clock back to late last winter. We asked the folks that take our survey, what do you anticipate land values are gonna be doing over the upcoming year? From where you're seated, if you see the, these bars that are pointing to the left, if you see the bars pointing to the left, that means they anticipate land values are going to be declining. And if you see the bars pointing to the right, they anticipate land values are gonna be increasing. Which way are they headed? To the right. What are the things driving land values? Crop prices, farm expansion, interest rates, things weighing down on land values, situation with input expenses and property taxes. One thing you might notice on there, 1031 tax exchange. Has anyone ever heard of a 1031 exchange? I had a real estate company in Nebraska tell me, uh, let me back up. 
a 1031 exchange. Let's say you inherit some ground over in Iowa and you farm outside of Lincoln. If you want to sell that ground in Iowa, buy some ground in Lincoln, a 1031 exchange, the basic idea is they basically let you sell that ground and buy a like producing asset, buy land in Nebraska, and you don't have to deal with capital gains. Or it's, you're moving the capital, you're moving that net worth or value from one over to the other one. As part of the, the people I talked to in the real estate industry, the one company mentioned to me 58% of their sales, either the buyer, so the person that's buying the land, either they sold some land somewhere else and they had to buy some, or the seller was being motivated by the 1031 tax exchange. So uh, obviously when land values get high, people get excited about, you know, maybe we need to reconfigure some of our ownership or some of those kind of things, okay? So my crystal ball for 2023, I would anticipate we're gonna still see things fairly strong. Just how much, I'm not exactly sure. So let's review briefly what did we talk on so far. Where do we find Nebraska Farm real estate information? Some very basics on what are the factors influencing land in Nebraska. The third key that I kind of pointed out today was at some point, someone, whether someone that buys farm real estate or someone that um, stands to inherit something, you may have to get an appraisal done at some point. So let's talk on the basics of just what it is if you're not aware. First thing, why do you have to get an appraisal done? Well, sometimes you need a third party opinion of value on the asset. Okay. A lot of us, if we have a, an attachment to land, maybe you grew up on it, your parents grew up on it, whatever, we need an accurate assessment of what's out there. Okay. And there's various estate reasons why we get that done. But land takes into account all those unique attributes of that property. That well that was drilled in 1958, that ditch that cuts through it, whatever. It takes into account um, the things that we have now. When you go drive around the countryside, uh, you see these grain bins. You might see grain bins that are five, 10,000 bushel. Then you see these new things getting built, what are they? 50,000 bushel or bigger sometimes. Appraisals that take into account what we call functional obsolescence. As we build things, if you can't, I mean, I'm sure everyone notices ag equipment's very large. When you built a machine shed 30 years ago versus if you built one today, the sidewalls, how big you need the sidewalls to be to get that big equipment in there is probably different, right? So that's that whole idea of, it takes into account all those unique factors or forces. So the question was, where does a county assessor come in? Do they have to come in on an appraisal? So a county assessors, I was hoping to avoid talking about assessed value. There's a difference between appraised value, market value versus assessed value. Assessed value is guided by state of Nebraska law and they specify how assessments, according to their definition of value, is conducted. How you assess land in South Dakota is different than how you assess it in Nebraska. And they have their procedures related to valuing buildings and some of these things as well. There, there are two different purposes. Market value is what we use when we talk about farm succession, inheritance, purchases. Assessed value is what we talk about when it comes to real estate property taxes, whether for land, buildings, whatever. Uh, just a few things to point out. If you get an appraisal, and I know we got people here that are representing different regions or interests of the state. First thing, you gotta find somebody that's licensed to do that type of work. Where's the land located at? Is it near a population center or do you have to send an appraiser three hours north into north central Nebraska? Uh, some of the costs that I've had reported to me around 15 to 2,500 on farmland. Ranches can cost a lot more. There are a lot more acres certain times. If you need to find an appraiser, it seems like I get a call about once or twice a month. Somebody's doing estate stuff or whatever. They need to get an appraisal done. 
One way to find these people in Nebraska, remember you have to be licensed in the state of Nebraska, you have to be a certified general appraiser to get market valuations done on your asset. You can go to the state of Nebraska website, there's a listing on there where you can click on a county, it'll bring up all the people in that county. They're just not licensed to do appraisals in that county, they're licensed for the entire state, it's just where the mailing address of their business license is held at. You can go on there and uh, take a look by county if you'd like. Just be aware if you're down here in the metro areas like Lancaster, Douglas, Sarpy, you click on them, they'll bring up a giant list of people. Some of those people may not do work in the real estate related to Eglin. Maybe they do commercial or residential. So if you do find someone, the first thing is, do you do farm real estate appraisal? And if they don't, second question is, do you know somebody that does? <laughs> so. The other thing, there's a professional group of farm managers and appraisers. It's called the American Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers. They have a website as well you can go on. You can search by region, by name. That's another way to find people. I'm a member of that group as an academic member. I do not do have any kind of real estate license in this state, so I can't appraise anything or manage it or whatever. Um, when we look at finding people to help us in life, I don't, it doesn't matter how old or young or anything in your between. Maybe you need a CPA, attorney, maybe at some time you need somebody that works in the real estate industry. I encourage people, one, you gotta find somebody that's licensed, okay? That's an appraiser. You, you hire somebody to sell some land, they gotta be a licensed broker. When you contact someone, be pithy in what you need. Just don't talk for a half hour to say, I have 160 acres north of Ashland, Nebraska. It's dry land, cropland. Uh, it's a nice square field. There is no ditch. There's no brush in it. Maybe even have the legal description. That way they can maybe get a feel for what you're looking for and provide you a rough estimate. And if maybe they're not available, maybe you're not comfortable with what they quoted you, reach out to other individuals. Okay. All right. And uh, number one thing, if you whether you use a farm manager, appraiser, CPA, attorney, visit with people. If you're not comfortable, visit with someone else. All right.